in the club. We met down here in the church uh, once once a month, and we had big suppers, you know, steak suppers and chicken suppers. And uh, one of the superintendents was down there that night from the plant. But uh, I tell them, when I first went to work over here years ago, I, I didn't make with a nickel an hour, you know. And I said, one week I drawed three dollars, I believe it was, and I said, I took my check back to the superintendent. I said, didn't y'all make a mistake in my check? I, I meant I didn't get enough money. And they said, I reckon we did. I said, you got the superintendent's check. <laughs> <laughs> he just hollered when I told him. <laughs> How much would you make in a, in a, in a day? Uh, I made a... Fifty-five cents. I worked for Nickel Hour when I first went to work. What year did you start working? Uh, I believe it was 30, 32, 31 or 32. 32, I believe. 31, I believe, because uh, I went to work, and we were working 11 hours a day. And uh, I worked with 14. You could go to work then whenever you wanted to if uh, you get the school superintendent to sign the papers for you. Well, I went to work, and I, I made a Nickel an hour. So how old were you then? Fourteen. And uh, I worked a while, then they raised me up to oh. ten cents an hour. But we were working uh, 11 hours a day. Then uh, on Saturday, we'd uh, go in and work five hours on Saturday. And Saturday at dinner, we was off. But when Roosevelt went in in 32, I believe, he started this NRA, and he said he's going to pay, I believe it was 25 cents an hour or more. Twelve dollars a week, I believe, what you could make, and that they's gonna have to pay it. And all, all these old people over here said they'll never do it. So they'll shut the mill down before they pay that much money. Well, they we went to work then. They, was, they started going to work at uh, seven o'clock in the morning, and we'd work six hours, I believe. We'd work to one o'clock. We'd work six hours at one o'clock. I just a little young boy, you know. We'd come home, my mother'd have dinner on the table. We'd eat dinner, and then I was free then till the next morning at 7 o'clock. And we just had the best time. And then on Saturday, we'd go in and work five hours. That'd make us 40 hours. What was your job? I was a dolphin twisters and curling twisters over in the mill, cleaning off twisters. They paid you by the check when you, after you got... After you know, you, got, you could come and sit a little closer, huh? Used to when when they started paying them by the check, you'd offer a whole twister. I forgot there's about two hundred bobbins of yarn on a twister. Then you'd off that. You take it off a full cone, put on an empty bobbin, and when you doff the whole twister, you got a dime because they have a check on there, and you keep them checks and every end you turn them in. Is and that how they were paying you when you started? Or no, that was after I worked a while and learned all that trade. Was it better to get paid that way? Well, I made uh, two dollars a day. Sometimes, according to how many twisters you do. If you do twenty twisters, you got two dollars that day. How did you feel when you walked out of there? Oh, I felt good. Were you tired? <laughs> no, then it didn't bother me. That's the reason I married him because he made twenty-five dollars a week, a lot of weeds, and that was more than any of the other boys were making. I thought he was rich. <laughs> you made twenty-five dollars a week. Well, I used to dolphin. You know, I could make that much. Because he was a good doctor. And we'd go out and he'd buy me a chocolate milk and a barbecue and I thought I'd die and gone to hell. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, is it, let's see, why don't you take this chair and, uh, um, let's see, you were talking, about, let's see, could you describe the, um, describe what the beginning of your job was like when you first went into the mill when you were 14? When I first went to Your work. Your first impressions, what it sounded like, what it felt like in there. If you could do that, let's, we'll just play a game. Try and talk about what the inside of that mill was like. Oh, well, I was kind of used to it because I'd go over every day and carry lunch. There's a lady lived down the street and I was going to school. Then she'd pay me 25 cents a week to go by her home and her mother would send her lunch and I'd carry it to the mill. And, uh, they they sat down in every day and eat their lunch, and I'd, I'd make a quarter a week <laughs> toting lunch over there to them, you know. Then I pretty well knew about the meal, but when I went to work in there, they put me to cleaning off twisters and oiling and sweeping, and 
I really had it made because I sweep up alleys with two rooms. Let's go down two alley with two rooms once the hour. It didn't take me 15 minutes to go over the floor, but then I mess around in until next time to go up. Pretty sad. Well, electric, electric lights, you know, were fairly new. A lot of people had lamps. They, and and they, the mill would be lit up, and he said he thought that was a pretty sight. He could look across the field coming from this direction up here. That mill lit up, you know. And every evening at 15 to 6, there would be quitting time over there before I went to work. I was just a kid. Then they'd flash the light, and I'd get out in the yard, winter and summer, and uh, well, in the summer, you know, it wasn't good dark at 15 to 6. But anyway, it, it time to stop. They'd flash the lights. They were lighting the mill, go off and come right back on, and you know it was stopping time. I'd get out there to watch them flash them lights. And watch people come home from work. What was it like when the, when the mill closed down after a shift? Well, the other shift that come in took over, you know. So did it, were the people streaming out of there? Yeah, mm-hmm. Everybody's in a hurry getting out. I, and I used to tell a little joke, you know. I said, we first moved up here on this village. The lights hung down out the top of the house, just one cord, and it had a little old switch on it. You just had to walk over there and turn that switch. And I told a little joke about it. I said, when we come from the country up here, I turned that switch off overnight and tried to get in the bed before the light went out. <laughs> 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 you moved here from the country? Mm hmm Well, how come? What year and why? We moved up here. I was six years old. What year would that be? Seventeen or six or three. Twenty-three. We're twenty-three. Well, we just wasn't making a living on the farm. Bow weavers and dry, dry weather were just killing us. And so we got a job up here and moved up here. And uh, I had uh, one, two, three, four, four, five, about six sisters, and they worked too, you know. And and when I went to work, my other sister went to work, it was all of us working, all but my mother, and she, and she stayed home and cooked, and she cooked three meals a day the year round. And I told somebody the other day, I said, I don't know how we stood it. I didn't believe it was hot then as it is now, it didn't bother me because uh, uh, she had a wood stove in the little kitchen about like this, and she cooked supper in the hottest summertime with a wood stove. And we'd sit around the table, and my mom would, sometimes she'd have uh, corn, she'd have fried corn and uh, tomatoes and hot biscuits. We didn't have, we didn't have iced tea. There wasn't no iced tea then. Wasn't no ice. Wasn't no ice, and I don't know if they had any tea or not, but we drank coffee. And I seen my pop, my daddy sit there and drink coffee and eat that hot corn and biscuits like that, and water would run off his elbow on the floor. It'd be so hot in there. But it didn't bother us. How many of you lived in the mill house that you stayed? The, over there, we see they was my mother and daddy and me and uh, six, sisters. six sisters. And you all moved here to East Noonan? Mm-hmm. What was East Noonan like then? And that was in the... 20s, right? 23. 23. Oh, this, I thought it was green. This house that built wasn't built, was it? This, these houses we in now wasn't built to 28. Three streets. 1928, they built this house, these houses, and the church down yonder. Bud's grandfather helped build these houses. Your grandfather helped build mm -hmm. these houses? The he new was, ones. He was a yeah. carpenter. So t you were going to tell me about the, 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 mill, the, the mill village when you first moved here. When we first moved here, I was just a small kid, and I had me a paper route. I, I delivered papers to every house. I knew everybody in this village and what house they lived in. And how many was in the family? Yeah, how many was in the family, and called them, all of them by the first name. But what she means with the houses well kept up. Yeah, was, they was, and it yeah. Was clean. It wasn't Company kept them up. Wasn't in garbage. Now, now people so back in them day, they didn't have grass on the lawn like you got now. If a sprig of grass come up in the yard, they take a hole and dig it up. And they sweep the yard. They sweep them with brush brooms. And the brush brooms were made out of dogwood limbs, and they would go to the woods about once or twice a summer and get uh, dogwood limbs for brush brooms, and they'd tie them together mm -hmm. and sweep the yards. And me and my mother would go over in the field to a broom sage. You know what broom sage is, don't you? Mm -hmm. We'd go over there and get broom sage, and we'd wring it off, and uh, 
she'd get a, a whole arm full, and I would. Then she'd make corn brooms. Then she'd sweep the house with them straw brooms. Now, what did the company do for the mill people then? It we, we, wasn't no recreation then. They had a ball team here. We had a ball team. They did. I wasn't big enough they at that gave time. Barbecue back once, once a year, year they give a barbecue on the Fourth of July. And at Christmas time, they'd give you a, a load of coal and give the, each kid in the family a sack of fruit. Right. They'd give a big sack of fruit and give us all a load of coal apiece. One of the guys at Christmas. Over, mm -hmm. One of the guys over at the plant would dress up like Santa Claus, and they'd come by on a mill company truck, and all the little kids would just. You know, get them. And um, what were the rules like? I mean, the the, the rules in order to, to live here. You see, we were talking before about rules that. Yeah, you couldn't you you couldn't drink and cut up, and you couldn't have dances around here. Then you know you had to come up to a certain standard, or you'd have to move. You couldn't get out here and raise cane, rail on your neighbor, and use bad language and stuff like that. Everybody had to come up to a certain standard. What was that standard? Could you describe it? Well, I would. You had to lead, lead a clean life. No drinking, no gambling, no chasing after your neighbor. You know what? Uh, the thing is that, unfortunately. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't, get, you couldn't <laughs> gamble. You couldn't uh, run after other men's wives and things like that. If you didn't walk a straight line, you were just gone. What happened if you drank? They'd fire you. And you would tell me before, maybe you could tell me again about, you know, if they knew that you'd been to Atlanta and they didn't... They didn't really investigate it. Somebody has told you was out drinking that day in Atlanta. You was gone Monday morning. They just said, we had to let you go. So were you afraid? I mean, no. did, you, did you live in fear? Like no, sir. We just big, happy family here. And I reckon it was some of the best cooks in East London that I ever seen. They was real good cooks here, and uh, we'd have a, you know, homecoming at the church, and nobody would take lunch, and we'd have reunion, nobody would carry lunches, or oh, it was just real nice. Yeah, well, but, well, I mean, I know that if I lived in a place, and someone, and I knew that there were all these rules, and there are, I mean, I, there are policemen, and there, there are rules that I have to live with, I guess I'm not afraid, but, I mean, I wonder if people lived in any sort of... How do people dealt with all that? What? Slip out, but he'd slip out behind the mill, and there was a colored man he worked with, and they were good friends. And the colored man stuttered, and Bud said, "I watched for you while you smoked." They were hid out behind the mill, slipped out. I watched for you while you smoked, and you watched for me while I smoked. And the guy said, "Okay." So Bud watched for him, and then when he he lit his cigarette, here come the superintendent coming around. That guy said. Twitch, twitch. He never did tell me. And he never did get it out, and the superintendent walked right up on him. But he <laughs> let him by because he was a good hand. And another time... Well, uh, can you comment on, on, on some of what uh, Edna said about being a, a shame, a disgrace if you were fired? Yeah, you know, people kind of look down on you if they fired you. And, and word got around, really got around on the village. You know, if something happened, if they fired you, you were drinking, or you'd been in a fight or something. They fired you. There's people that kind of look down on you. And what? And then what would happen to those people that were fired? They'd have to leave. They had to go somewhere else and get a job. And sometimes that you'd stay out a while and come back. And sometimes if they need you, they'd rehire you. If you and, were and if did, they had a did you lose any friends that way? No, not really. I really enjoyed working over there. I, I just, I just, I just had a good time. <laughs> Tell me about the good time. Well, I'd make a few dollars a week, and I started going with her. Me and her would go to the pitch show once a week, maybe, and we'd go buy this barbecue place over here, and I'd get her a chocolate milk and a barbecue, and we'd just sit there and have a feast. Let me tell you something about my mother while we're talking about this. We had a little store right down here. Then that time, I was small, and there wasn't no houses here. This was a ballpark where we live in now. They played ball here every Saturday. Did, did the mill have a baseball team? Yeah. They what had was a, the name of your team? East Noonan. East Noonan ball team. And uh, Did they play the Crackers? No. They, they were just amateurs. And my mother had a little stand right down here at the foot of the hill. 
and uh, she'd go down there on Saturday and I'd go down there with her. And uh, she'd sell a, a hot dog and uh, she'd make pork hamburger. You've heard of beef hamburger. She'd make pork hamburger and she'd sell a hamburger all the way, onions, mustard, and ketchup and everything. And she'd sell a hot dog and she'd sell a Coca Cola. And all three of them would cost you 15 cents. That's what she sold for nickel a piece. You know. And you helped her out? Yeah, I was small, but I'd help her out, and she she'd just sell them down there every Saturday. We had a tub full of ice and water, and she'd put them drinks in there, you know, and she'd sell them hot dogs down there. Chuck Fellow, about that time, right after we married, he loved the movies like I love books, and we had one quarter between us, and there was a picture show, picture on it to show that he wanted to see. And he was going to take that quarter and he was going to go walk to town and see the movie and walk back. And uh, there was a man. When me and her got married, we went down here at Mobile and got married. And I said, when Did we Did you got, get married in secret? No, we, ah. we, we went down there to Justice Peace and he married us. And I told him, I said, I decided I'd give her two dollars and kiss the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> did anybody come to the wedding, or just the two of you? Just four of us. A couple went with us. Um, I was. Someone told me that a number of couples would get married in secret because if it was known that they both were working, then they'd lose their job. Well, they did. They lost them. Get married. Stay married a year in secret. Nobody didn't know it. You know. But but what it was uh, when uh, once I laid off, I didn't have nothing to do. When was and, that? That was in uh, uh, 1938, I believe it was, 38 or 39, they laid me off. And me and her lived here, and we didn't have nothing. And my mama, she'd help us out, and her, her mama and, and daddy would help us out. They'd give us milk and butter, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. And uh, me, and another, me and my neighbor, we'd frog gig at night and fish in the daytime and hunt. And that's what we lived on mostly. One day I had to go to town, at that time, uh, they had an unemployment place up there at that time, and you'd sign up, and uh, after so long, you could draw three or four dollars a week to help help out, you know. And uh, I started home one day, and I thought, I just was thirsty, I couldn't stand it. I said, Lord, I wish I had a Coca Cola. And uh, there was a tobacco sack laying there on the sidewalk, and I just kicked that tobacco sack, and it had something in it. And I picked it up and opened it, and there was three dollars and a half in it. and uh, I bought me a Coca Cola and come on, walked on home and went down in the country and bought me and her a, a pig. And uh, we killed that pig in the fall, and that pig weighed 500 something pounds. And you talking about living off the hog, me and her living. <laughs> we had a good living long as that hog lasted. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about working in the mill during the NRA when it went eight hours? Yeah, I was working there when it went on eight hours. Can you talk about what that was, what about the change was like? Well, it, it was it was real good for us because I went to work at, at 7 o'clock where I'd been working, you know, and we'd have to work uh, eight hours. We had to work 11 hours. We worked 11 hours. Then when that NRA went in, that they cut the hour down to eight. Then we worked uh, seven hours a day. And I'd get off at lunch, and I wouldn't have to work no more till the next morning. And I'd come home, eat lunch, and I could play ball or go in where I wanted to. Now, was the work different once they cut it down from no. 11 hours to 8 hours? Uh -uh. Same thing. Just on Saturday morning, we'd have to go over and work 5 hours to make our 40 hours. Some people have told me that the work got harder because, because it was you know, packed into a shorter period of time. Well, I can't remember getting that much harder on, on me because I doffed twisters and then I couldn't doff no more than, you know, and I've been at it. Well, I mean, a lot of folks that I've talked to told me a bit about in the 1930s that one of the biggest problems that they had was the um, problem of the stretch out. You know, when, you know, yeah. if they were working. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about how that affected the work over here? Well, gradually, I see that so. Gradually. No, it's actually not. Oh, it got with, to get a little like, harder, but right then it, I couldn't tell much but difference. But see him doing piece work. Right. He done all he could do in eight hours, what he'd been doing all he could do in 11 hours. 
but so, on a regular job, so like, it was, I operate the machine. You know, I, I, you were saying in the spinning room. In the spinning room, a uh, full job was eight spinning frames. A uh, beginner would start on six or four, four or six. Now, and then you? when you learned... You could run eight spinning frames. That was tops. But, uh-huh. But after uh, they cut it down to eight hours and raised your wages, some of them had to run uh, like 12 frames or 16 frames. So it went up like that. Now, were you working then? I, I went to work when I was 16. And they they, had, they passed child, child labor laws. I don't remember what year. But I went to work when I was 16. And what, how, what year was it when you were 16? 1936. And right after that, they issued us uh, social security numbers. And mm -hmm. that was the strangest thing. Everybody was fearful. We didn't understand it. And everybody was saying, you know, that we would be given a number, you know, and it would be the mark of the beast and all that stuff. And it was weird. <laughs> um. Were you living here prior to 1936, or you moved here in 36? We moved here in 1932. My family did, from the country. And after my grandfather lost a lot of his land, and you know, in the drought and the bow weevil and everything, and we lived on his farm when I was small. And then uh, when we heard about the NRA going into effect, and twelve dollars a week was a lot of money to somebody that lived on the farm because we didn't get paid but once a year except maybe we'd sell a few vegetables and things along. And uh, that just seemed like a fortune to us, or to my mother and daddy. So we moved up here. What'd you, and you, tell me about your grandma, my, your grandmother's reaction. My grandmother didn't want us to move to the cotton mill. She'd heard so many horror stories about the cotton mill and the cotton mill village and people called them lint heads because they didn't have humidifiers or air conditioning or anything back in those days. And she was afraid that we'd get some dread disease or get lice or scabies or something. And she told my mother, this was my mother's mother-in-law, and you can imagine how well that went over with my mother. My mother-in-law, her mother-in-law told us, said, I'd rather see you take those children to the graveyard than to take them to a cotton mill village to be brought up. No telling how they'll turn out. And so every day when we'd get home from school, my mother would make us wash our hands in germicidal soap, and she'd look up our heads to be sure that we didn't have cooties. <laughs> and that, that went on for about two months. And then after that, she kind of relaxed because she found out that people here were just like people in the country. They were decent people and and went clean and nice as they were, you know, and dressed as nice as they were able to afford, and they were just ordinary people. What, what, what kind of horror stories do you think your grandma had heard? Well, you know, they used to have, they used to call them, you know, sweatshops, like they'd hire child laborers. Well, he was 14, and that was much too young. He should have been in school. But the school superintendent, all his daddy had to do was go up there and tell him that his uh, son wanted to go to work, and he was 14 years old, and if, you know, the school superintendent signed permission for him to go. Who would go to the superintendent, his dad? His father. Me and my father went. Now, it was the school... How was the school connected to the mill? Well, the mill built the school, yeah, didn't they? They owned the school. Really, they built the building but the and county, furnished everything. But the county yeah. Yeah. Uh, furnished the teachers. Yeah, the county furnished the teachers and all like that. But the, the mill company furnished the school and the playground equipment and all like that to start with. Um, did most the students that went to the school end up working in the mill? Was that just sort of common? Most of them yeah. did, but... Uh, in uh, later generations, uh, each generation tried to better themselves, and we've got we've got uh, ministers and, and uh, uh, real estate dealers and doctors and lawyers and Did, everybody you know now that that they got their start here and businessmen. Having, you heard what your grandma said to your mother, or did your mother just tell you? 
I heard her. And I thought it would, I thought, well, what are we getting into, you know, because it, it frightened me. And what did you think when you got here? Can you remember? I know you were a little girl. I thought we had moved to town because we had running water and electric lights. And we had a outside bathroom. It was behind the house like the, ha like the one in the country. But it had a handle on the commode that you could mash down and it would flush. And I just thought it was fascinating. <laughs> and what did you think of all the people and the way the village was laid out? And I just thought we'd move to town. You know, it was just, to me, I'd always lived in the country and lived on my fa grandfather's place. And I just thought we'd really move to town because, you know, we just had so many more conveniences here than we had in the country. And even by today's standards, you know, the, they were inadequate, but back then I just thought it was great. And I had so many children to play with, and so many new acquaintances. So many neighbors. Mm -hmm. We had neighbors everywhere, and we, us men, well, I wasn't no man, I just a child. And we'd meet at a certain houses on Sunday evening, and we'd have a horseshoe game. We'd play, you know, you could play till somebody beat you, then you, when they beat you, you had to sit down and let somebody else play. And we really enjoyed it. And did your mom and dad go to work in the mill too? Mm hmm What was that like for them, having come from the country, I mean, them being adults and all? I don't really know, but uh, my mother didn't work when we first moved here. She stayed home and kept house and looked after us, and my father worked. And then later on, uh, my mother taught school when I was a little girl, but she didn't have a master's degree, and it got to the point. She went to teachers every summer. They went to summer school, you know, the teachers did. And uh, she got pregnant with my older brother, I mean my younger brother to me, but he was my oldest brother. She got pregnant with him and didn't get to finish and get her master's degree and it got where they wouldn't hire you if you didn't have a master's degree. So uh, she had to go, to, she went to work in the mill up here and then later on they left here and uh, she uh, worked it in the school system as uh, uh, she supervised the cafeteria at Sonoy at Brantley High. Um, did your family blend in real well with the, with the, with the with the Mill Village? Oh, yeah. We made friends that we have lasted a lifetime. And you know, this might sound strange. Is this what you're going to say? Well, you say it. It, it, say it. it may sound a little strange, but if you if I slept late, they wouldn't holler a neighbor around here that I couldn't run in there and eat breakfast with them and, you know, maybe uh, have a cup of coffee and maybe a biscuit and something like that. They just, you just, they just all family to us, and uh, somebody asked us how come we didn't didn't move, go to town or say somewhere or another and pay high rent. I said, Are these people down here too good? I said, I got neighbors. I said, if I need a loaf of bread, I need a little help, I can go to the neighbor's house and they'll help me, and then people up, up town didn't know me. What were you going to say? I don't know. You were talking about family. Oh, everybody on the village was just like one big family. You know, like in all groups, you know, you you related to one person maybe better than you did the other. You were closer to one person than you were to the other. But as a whole, if uh, somebody across the pond that you weren't all that close to and they had sickness in the family or death in the family, somebody would get out and make up, go to each house, up and down each street, and everybody gave what they could. And they'd make up groceries, some money or whatever they were in need of, and help each other out. Um, can you talk a little bit about Roosevelt coming in? Well, we just thought he was great. And, I mean, when he died, it was like losing a member of the family because he had done so much for the working people. At one time, they tried to organize a union here, and there was a lot of controversy about it. And... Uh, a lot of people want it, and a lot of people didn't want it, but the ones that didn't want it won out. They just didn't want a union, you know. And the mill company didn't, of course, they didn't like it either. 
That was in 1934, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, can you, what happened then? Can you describe that? Well, I was still a child, and I was still in school, and I don't remember a lot about it except I remember uh, some men coming to our house and telling my daddy that uh, if he didn't join, he would be sorry. And he said, if somebody comes to my house trying to make me join, they're going to be sorry. He had a big double-barrel shotgun standing in the corner. And he said, I just as soon, the, the people in the mill, the supervision in the mill, told me what to do is to have a union telling me what to do. I don't think a lot of them really understand what unions were all about at that time. And my biggest impression of it, I had started somewhere one day, and I was going down the street, and there was a truck load, a big truck, with an open body on it, and people were standing up in there, and they were waving sticks and yelling. What were they yelling? It was, I don't know, they were just yelling, and it was frightening to me, because I didn't know what it... They called lots of us gabs and all like that, because we didn't join the union. And I went to, went to work one morning. The gates were locked. They had chains around the gates. The, the union had went over and locked all the gates that night. And the next morning they just sent us back home. And uh, I don't think we was out maybe a day or two. And they sent work for us. All of them wanted to work, come back. And we went back, went to work. Were there people picketing out in front? And some of them would, yeah. Mm-hmm. Scabs. They call some of us scabs, and some may have been a little worse than that. <laughs> and what were your feelings about all that? Well, I, then I didn't much care, you know. I was just a kid. I didn't, I didn't have to work, really. I could have went back to school, uh, uh, but I just wanted to have a little money to spend. You were about uh, 16 years it, old? I was 15, I think. And, you know, for entertainment here, you know, we didn't have no kind of recreation much, and... Uh, once a week or maybe once a month, all us young people get together. Now, you ever heard of a pound supper? Mm-mm. All us young ki- kids that want to get together, we'd give a pound supper. We talked one of the neighbors in a notion of giving us a pound supper, and everybody went and took a pound or something like a pound of candy, a pound of uh, walnuts, uh, pecans or something like that, and we'd all get in there and have we'd play spinning the bottle, and we'd play uh uh, walking wasn't it? You know, you you uh, go in, you'd go in a room, they'd blindfold you, and you'd walk around and shake hands with all the girls, and one you uh, uh, picked out, you'd you'd take her to walk. You know, it was well, I really enjoyed bring, uh, living here. Um, I've I've actually seen some movies of um, that strike in '34 in Noonan. Yeah. Yeah, they had the National Guard down here. Did you see that? Yeah. Could you describe that? Well, there was a bunch of them. They didn't come to this meal. They come to meal number one up there. This was meal number two. And they come to meal number one. And lots of spectators. Were you there? I, was, I wasn't right there at it. I was out from it. But lots of them were there. And the National Guard gathered them all up and took them to Atlanta. And they had to get out the best way they could. Some of them did. They, they, they let them out. They know there wasn't no part of it. But they thought they were... Part of it too, you know. And going to Atlanta in those days was like going to New York. Now. <laughs> Did you hear about those folks that were rounded up and brought to Atlanta? Yeah. What'd you hear about it? I just heard they they, they was up there just watching in the, the National Guard just come around, load them up in a truck like cattle, and took them to Fort Mac. I think it was. That's right. I actually we actually have a movie. Of that, mm-hmm. yeah, when they picked them up, yeah. and brought them over there. Some of them, some of them had ki- little kids at home. They got them too, and they had to go. And I know there's one fellow worked here. That he was a, a guard over here, and he uh-huh. went up there to see it. He had his gun buckled on him. They got him, and uh, one of the big boss, bosses went out there and, and told them, you know, they let him go. But well, they can take him on the line too. But they took the strikers, I guess. Yeah, that's what they was taking, the strikers. They with the work. Yeah, they they was. That was something, huh? Mm-hmm. He said he was 14. He was older than that because he's about four years older than him. So you were well, about 18? I, I, was, well, I might have been then, but uh, I was 14 when I went to work over there. 
Of course, I'd been working a long time when they... And you went to work in 1932? Yeah. So you were 16 at that time, I guess. Did anyone try and talk to you about... To, I mean, do you remember them trying to organize around here? Or yeah, they come around and try to get you, and, and uh, they talk pretty rough to you if they you didn't. They threaten you, didn't Yeah, they threaten you if you didn't join, because they said, it's, you, you ought to join, because uh, you're helping us out, and you're doing wrong if you stick with the company and all, but I know who was feeding us, <laughs> and I didn't want to get tangled up in that union. What happened to those folks that did get tangled up? They, they left here. They had to leave here. Did some of them ever come back? Yeah, I think some of them kind of come back. Uh -huh. Years later, but a lot of them went to other meals uh, yeah. and got jobs. And it was hard for them to get jobs because nobody wanted a union in there. No, they didn't want a union if then. If they hadn't threatened my daddy like they were going to make him, he might have joined. Do you, what do you think that, that they were all working for then? I mean, they said they were working for better working conditions. Do you remember this? Yeah, and that you were saying that you do. You, do you remember that? Do you remember like people talking about what they wanted back then? They wanted more money and better working conditions, less you know, few hours, the right to refuse overtime and all that stuff. But I think they went at it the wrong way, because they went at it threatening people if they didn't join, what they would do to them. And that was the wrong attitude. A lot of people, they might have, if they had reasoned with them, they might, they might have joined. But back in those days, jobs was back in those days, jobs were so scarce that everybody was so afraid of being fired if they joined the union of losing the job that they wouldn't have joined anyway. Some of them thought that was the end of the world if you got you lost your job. You know that that's all you had. Because to. jobs were so scarce. It was hard to get work. And, it, and and here, if you lost your job, you lost your house. Right. Yeah, you had to move. And all your utilities. Now, now did, how did they do they, they did their organizing door to door? I mean, they knocked on the door? Well, I'll or? tell you how they started it. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. They was, they was some people come here, and I knew some of them, and some of them I didn't know. And we met over at the schoolhouse over there. They had a meeting over there, and I went over there. And I never did really understand what they really wanted. What were they? Do you, can you describe what that was all like? Yeah, they just get up, and make a speech, and tell you what they're gonna do. But I never did quite understand what they really wanted. Do you remember what they were saying? Well, I, some of it. They said we'd get more money, then uh, we'd have better jobs and all. But I, I, I didn't see where they they could do that. Now, this was at around the same time that you had already gotten eight hours and yeah. 40, 40 hours a week yeah. and um, a minimum wage. Yeah. Which, so it's interesting that at a time when they would have gotten more money and less hours, that, that they decided that this was the time mm. to strike. Now, as I understand it from the research that I've done, this was the largest single industry strike in the history of the United States. Ever, even today, this kind of mill strike, biggest. Well, at that time, it was all over the United States. It, it was that, all over the country. We didn't know that. We didn't have TVs then. We at that know. time, you know, when they <laughs> when they was raising so much cane uh, about that, uh, they done uh, moved us. Uh, they paid men. They paid a little bit better than minimum wages over here. At this mill. If, if uh, sometime if uh, minimum wage was forty cents an hour or twenty five, they paid a little bit over that. We draw a little bit more than than uh, some place it would. Now, do you so so there was this meeting? Do you remember was the meeting before the strike took place? Yeah, after, it, it was before. before uh huh. And they did they tell everybody there's going to be this big strike? Do you want to come out with us or not? Or was that a big surprise to everybody on the village? Well, the biggest thing I heard them say, I I wouldn't want to get out. But they said they would talk about you know. Do you think they meant something? They were using that as like an allegory, like a story. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. What do you think that would mean? I don't really know. Can you I imagine? Read, no, I was reading. I couldn't really understand what they wanted. You know, they they'd him haul around. You know, about different things, that, like that. They weren't concise about what they were telling. I, I, I guess. And I don't think they really had the thought to do nothing much. I don't think they did. 
So how long did this all last? Oh, it lasted about five or six months, I reckon. Then there was a store down here, lots of meat down that store down there. And I heard later on that the, the, they said if they caught any employee down there and some of them meeting, they're going to have to discharge them. So the employee didn't go down there. <laughs> so this was all in secret? Was it in secret or was it open at first? Well, it was kind of open over we at the schoolhouse because we was out in the backyard, you know, out there. Just gathered there in the backyard. And the fellow got up on the back porch of the schoolhouse and made a talk. But, but as it progressed, it got more secret. Yeah, it got more secret. Because, you know, the, the, the uh, mill didn't want their employees talking to union organizers. And they would get on to you, you know, about it and call you in and talk to you, you know. Look, if you go in with them, we're going to have to let you go or something like that. Did you, did you, were you ever called in? Uh-uh. I never did. Did me. you know people that were called in? Did you hear about that? I've heard some of them talk to them, you know. But uh, uh, I just hear say I didn't go, go in there with them, you know. They talk about it, about what they're going to do and how they're going to do things. But did, did, you, did, you, did you see, like, you know, the people at work be called up to somebody and say, look, you can't, if you join this, you're going to be out? I mean, was that an open threat? Did everybody uh, know that? No, the company didn't do that. They didn't do it that way. They didn't. They didn't threaten you about you know that if you join, we're gonna fire you. Cause I don't think they could at that time. But they they really. Um, well, they did. To see, the thing, the interesting thing is that there was a law called Section Seven A, which was a part of the NRA, which said that every worker in the country had the right to collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. okay. So. And that's one of the reasons why everybody thought that they could join the union because they thought Roosevelt said, "Go for it," mm -hmm. you know, because it was it was legislation. So there was legislation that said they could. So, um, but you're right. I mean, that part about that not being able to fire people because of that, they passed that. But I don't know. You know, most people didn't listen. A lot of the companies never listened to that anyway. So, well, if they'd went at it at the right time, at the right way. Yeah. Then they'd got some leaders, I mean leaders, not just pick up somebody here and there. And just, uh -huh. They might have done something at that time. So these people that came weren't leaders? I wouldn't say they were, uh -uh. Were they outsiders? Or yeah, insiders? they were outsiders. They were all outsiders. Most of them come in here, you know. So this is something that we're trying for historical purposes to understand how this all came about. Because... All we know is that this was the largest strike in the history of the United States in one industry. And it's not, there's, there's barely known about it amongst the cotton mill people in the South. I mean, we don't know very much about it. We happen to have, we have lots of photographs and lots of old movies. Well, not a lot, but some. And, uh, you know, this is one part of the history that we're looking at that we are trying to understand a little bit 56 years later to see what was the impact of such a, of such a big moment. So. When you, when you uh, didn't have no other way to make a living, it was kind of scary on I employees, because if you got fired, you, you were hurting. At that time, I don't think we had no unemployment where you could go up there and draw money. You had to find a place to live. You had to find your place to live. And, you had to hire somebody to move you. Yeah, it, it was it was kind of scary back in them days. I bet, I bet, I bet. So then, this did this just blow over? What happened? It finally just blowed over. And they come back again and try to organize again one time, and they did have a vote on it. Really? They, what yeah. year was that? No, uh, let's see what year that was. I forget what year that was. It was about 39, 40, somewhere along in there. Was and they had a vote. Everybody over in the mill voted. And, but the uh, union lost because the people that worked there, it was close, but uh, they voted not to have it. Was the organizing different this time? Did the yeah, people it was do it differently? Yeah, it was different. How was it different? Well, they, they give you a chance to vote on it, you know. And we, they met up upstairs over at the mill, and all the employees... 
went in and voted. They just, uh, we had a ballot there, and you could go in and vote either way you wanted to. And then nobody didn't uh, tell you how to vote or impress you to vote one way or another. You just went up there, and, and they, they wouldn't lie. Nobody said nothing to you, and you went in there and voted. And did they explain it? Did those organizers explain it differently this, this time than they did Oh, the yeah, it, yeah, it was different in the ways. But uh, I, I knew they wasn't going in because people wasn't going to accept it. Why don't you think people would accept it? Oh, they was they was a little bit gun shy. <laughs> One thing. Oh, where in the world could you uh, people find a house like this house here? You know what this house rented for a week, a month. Well, you you paid it every week, but you know how much this house rented for? How much? Two dollars and forty cents a week. That was twelve dollars a month. What could the people? At that time, find a house for that. And that's what held a lot of people down, you know. They couldn't find a house this good for no $12 a month. Huh? <laughs> you know what I had to give for this house? How much? When, I, when we bought it? Well, the company sold them. And, uh, Why they, did the company sell them? They want to get rid of the houses. And uh, they, they uh, said they're going to sell these houses, and you had a a chance to buy it. You had the first choice. If you want to buy it, all right. If you didn't, you didn't have to buy it. Well, they they had some people over here, company sent some people over here in this building over here. We used to be a little schoolhouse there. And you, we went over there and I asked them what did they want for this house. And that woman looked at it and said, $2,200. And I said, for that house, $2,200. What it was, you really had to pay a down payment or three months rent. That was seventy something dollars. Then it done gone up a little bit. Then you paid three month rent in advance, and that was your down payment. You didn't have to pay no more till the first of the year. Then it, these payments on this house run twenty three dollars or something a week. Did you pay off? I mean, a month. Oh gosh. We had ten years to pay it off. I never missed it. Never I'm even. sure you never did. Mm -hmm. We've done all these improvements. Well, the house is wonderful. I mean, it is impossible to buy a house for that amount of money. I mean, the neighborhood would be great if they, you know, everybody would buy their house. Would clean up around the places. In 34. The longest thing I know, Mama Doris worked in here, and she honored the picket line. She would not cross it, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they was off, off on strike a good while. I do know this for a fact. I was a young boy. Two of the fellows crawled over the fence. Claude Morris locked the gate when the strike started. Two of the fellows crawled over the fence and went into the plant. He sent in the plant and put them back out the fence. They crawled over to go to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I and these was, did I he, know that happened. Do you know the purpose and the reason why he locked the, the gate so no, people could I get do, in? I do not know. All I know is that he did lock the gate, and the man that crawled over the fence and went in told me he did and said they'd come in and put him back out. In, in <laughs> I worked with him. In the 34th strike, can you remember how things was in the household if you was a kid and how things was? Did things get pretty tough as far as meeting, you know, the uh, needs, the, you know, groceries and et cetera? Well, needs. no, not really. Uh, I admire Claude Morris, mm -hmm. for he was a good man. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact that when he was, uh, had controlling stock in Salisbury Mill, if a family, in fact it happened to my family, was out sick, he would send groceries from the company store to your house and never say a word about it because I've seen that happen and know it happened. Mm -hmm. He was a good man. What about, do you know what uh, initiated or what, uh, why the purpose and the reason the people went out on strike in 34? Do you know? No. You can't remember that? No. Okay. I had an aunt and uncle aunt and my mother both worked there though when it was going on. But you can't remember the reasons why or no. what really pushed no. the people to the no. point of strike. No. Were they in the union? No, I don't think my mother and, and aunt was in the union. 
but they honored the picket line and would not cross it. And uh, I wonder if each of you could just go around, and starting with you, could tell us uh, when you first started hearing about unions, whether you ever heard it in the schools, and what's your history about unions? Well, I don't even remember when I first heard about a union. I guess it was back then. I didn't know really what a union was or what it was going on. I knew my mother and them said they was on strike and they didn't go to work. Mary, your knowledge of a union, your first knowledge of it. Well, I think it was um, probably back in the early 60s, you know, like at school days and stuff like that. I'd probably hear about it over radio or TV, and no, I was not familiar with it or what the purpose was. Not really. I was just wasn't into that at the time. Well, I'll say about 65 when I first heard about a strike. I didn't know what a strike was. I just thought they was just striking at something, you know. <laughs> but now I really understand what it's all about. Mm. I guess. When I started to work, I started hearing stuff about unions and strikes and stuff. <coughs> and you first started work here or somewhere else? Somewhere else. At Calumia. Okay. I heard about, you know, union strikes and all that, but I didn't know what it were, I didn't know. Okay. Do you have any reason to be afraid of it? Uh, afraid of unions? No, I wasn't afraid of it, I just didn't know what it was. <coughs> When I worked at Cannon, I heard about some, you know, strike, but they say I didn't know what it was. I was just going about what other folks were saying for that part. You and now, when you, were you there when they tried to organize uh, Cannon in the early uh, 70s, in 70 and in 85? Not, I'm seeing. You was here then? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, just coming in. I was. The first time I heard about unions, I guess, my, I had heard my dad talk about them. And then I went to work at Cannon Mills. <coughs> Let's go back that Start again and tell me what your dad said about unions. Uh, well, I don't really remember exactly what he would say, but he would say something like... Uh, uh, let's start again and say your daddy. Okay. <laughs> I remember my daddy talking about unions, and I don't really remember exactly what he would say. I know he would come in and say, you know, certain unions on strike or whatever, and I didn't understand it. And then when I went to work in Cannon Mills in 73... They were running an organizing campaign, and I was into it. I wanted to find out what it was all about, so I got interested in it and stayed with it. And they didn't, the union wasn't voted in, and I was threatened for being, you know, active in it. And all my supervisor called me in the office and told me, You're going to be fired. I said, Well, fire me. Fire me now, you know. And then when I come to work here, first thing I did was sign a card. And I really didn't get active, though, until I had to file a grievance, and then I really got active then. <laughs> I was shop steward, and then last year I run for vice president, and I won that. And I believe in it. <laughs> what gave you the courage to tell your shop that you're a boss that? When I was back in 73, Bob Freeman, one of the organizers, he told us what our rights were. You know, and he, if, if he, I believed him, and if he tells me this is your right to do this, the man didn't have a reason to lie to me, you know, and it's something I, I believed in. So, I mean, they, I, I don't know why I done if they really would have fired me. I'd have went crying to Bob, I guess. Hey, <laughs> they fired me. <laughs> but they didn't. They just, you know, he just told us, you can't hand out this letter to him. Then I told him when I could. You know, I can on break time and in the restrooms and things like that. And he just kind of shut up. But they watched me. I mean, they looked for me to make mistakes, but I made sure I didn't. Okay, okay you said Yes, uh, my first knowledge of the union was in my early teens. My father was uh, always a supporter of uh, organized labor, and and that was in uh, the late 60s. From then, I didn't know anything. I never heard a lot about it in school. They didn't teach a lot about it in schools, in the southern uh, schools, which was uh, predominantly black at that time before segregation. Uh, then after I got up to a teen, I started working. I started hearing about unions and somewhat got involved with it through the media and radio and somewhat to that nature. And when I went to work and I left North Carolina, went to work in uh, uh, Alexander, Virginia. I stayed in Washington, D.C. and I joined the Teamsters there and I was 19 at that time. 
And I got familiar with the union at that point in time, and when I moved back south in 72, uh, I started then involved at the union, uh, very little bits and pieces of it about Cone. And then in 79, I've become very active and have been active ever since, uh, and that was my knowledge of the union to this point. Now, <clears throat> a lot of the, the white people who have been in the unions have heard from the parents and grandparents that they got a lot of people got in trouble in the 30s and don't want to have anything to do with it. Your people didn't have a chance to be in the Union uh, in textiles until the 60s. Do you think that's made a difference in the response of blacks against whites in the Union? Um, if I, if I uh, follow your question correctly, <coughs> yes, I think that has an impact on it because... Uh, explain what you're talking about. What I'm talking about is the difference between uh, the black, per se, more or less movement toward the Union movement versus the whites, and in the early uh, early 19th century, what I'm saying is 1938 and 40s and 50s, blacks were not uh, allowed to work in certain particular parts of the mills and certain jobs definitely which we're aware of. And I believe now since uh, the 60s and the 70s, blacks have had an opportunity to come in and to you know, seek other opportunities, other jobs, and that has made a difference and possibly have some uh, degree of effect on the, the black-white uh, racial balance in the unions. Yes, I do believe that. Well, my, I never heard of a union until I came to work at Cone Mills. And when I came to work here, I knew there was a union here, but you didn't see any union activity. Uh, you, you didn't know, you didn't have anybody to go to if you had a problem, but we did work under a contract. And the union started, activi <coughs> started activity around 1979, I think it was, and I got involved in the union then. And I, I got involved in it, but I really didn't understand it then. You know, I'd get mad and say, well, you know, getting out of that union. They're not doing anything for me. You know, so I'd get out of the union, and then a little while later I'd get back in, and then about two years ago, Brenda's husband uh, came to me and asked me to uh, run for an office because they had had a vacancy. And so I got active then, and, you know, now I've been going to negotiations and, and a, a lot of different things, and I really see what a union's doing. And I'm in here to stay. You know, it's a good thing. Okay. All right, just, okay. Well, I I didn't hear that much about a union when I was small, except that I did know that my dad did work at North Carolina Finish Company, which was a union. And I'm like Bonnie. Uh, I talk come to work here at Cone Mills. I didn't get. I joined the union, but I didn't get involved until I had a grievance. That's when I started getting active, and that's when I started learning, you know, our rights and what we could do. And you know, I'm like the rest of y'all. I just I believe in it, and I'm gonna stick to it, and that's it. It's just something you know that's in me. Okay. Uh, we're gonna. <laughs> okay. Could you tell us? Start telling us what. The, tell them what they're gonna see, and then we'll start it. Okay. Uh, this film is about the uh, strike in uh, strikes in Georgia in 1934. Uh, you know, this is all over the, the country in 1934, and this happens to be a scene from Gastonia on Labor Day. Oh, okay. Start again. <laughs> tell them about this first? Yeah, uh, just tell them about the, the strike, the, the 34 strike all over the country, <coughs> and then we're going to see some scenes from si the south, and this is Labor Day in uh, Gastonia. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to see some uh, uh, footage that was taken from uh, uh, the 1934 strikes all over the South. But first, we're going to see um, uh, a film of the Labor Day Parade in Gastonia.
condition with us at the Smart Manufacturing Company, which is the same, one of the same chain of mills as the Markdale. There's a few of you people here that belongs to this organization, and we want you to join and set you up a union local here. I know you can have a good union local. We just talked with the superintendent. He first wanted us to wait till 2 o'clock to stop off. I come out here and put it to a vote. And the people voted 100% to stop off now. I went back in another conference with the superintendent and he asked me how long we gave him to stop off which we realized that we have to give him time to raise our weights to take care of the rollers because we want to work again but we want better conditions when we work again More scenes around the mill here. Stop it just a moment. Let me stop. Sorry, you get it to stop. Uh, just a moment, let me get something on the screen. Uh, this is not working from that distance. Sorry. <coughs> everybody to understand that at this time people were so afraid of management in the plant that, that they didn't, they were afraid to do anything on their own. So they got a bunch of people together and went around to other plants and got people out of the other plants, you know, so they could all join together. And that's how they formed the Flying Squadrons. See if I can get this thing moving again. <laughs> Long range.
Going ahead just a moment. Yeah, they walked a long time. The great textile strike spreads. Here are typical scenes in Gastonia, North Carolina. <laughs> With the total on strike nearing half a million, over 200,000 are out in the southern states where already lives have been lost and many wounded. At the first reports of bloodshed in the Carolinas and Georgia, President Roosevelt appointed a special mediation board in an effort to end growing disorder. and strike orators help to fan the flame. throughout New England by Robert Walkout. The crisis was growing braver as these films were issued, but federal intervention brought hope of restored peace. You notice that uh, the newsreels were very much <laughs> you notice that? I did. Yes. Talk about that. Uh, they make it look like the unions are the bad guys and we're in there causing problems. Like there's no problems there to start with, but we're looking for problems. Yeah, but they're not showing what it was like for these people to work with these textile That's it. That's it. Well, That's what those people face then. Do you face anything like that now? Well, but we face something to that extent. Not not what they were facing, you know, the, as far as the company being the ruler. but. We face problems like that now with management. Uh, uh, when, of course, we have a procedure to go through now. We call it the grievance procedure. <laughs> but the difference now and the difference then is it was more or less, uh, back then I think it was more or less physical and a hostile type atmosphere. But the companies now has become more, you know, I would say, uh, uh, I would say professional and dealing with these problems. They keep it more suppressed and only so, you know, they, they give you a, I would say, the uh, old, you know, uh, you know stroking the, stroke me approach wherein they come in and play up to you, but yet and still they're doing the same things in a different, more complicated, and in a more, I would say, sophisticated manner than they did back then. That's the difference. The, the, primarily the same things is going on, but it, it's more or less undercover and not as, more, as publicized as it was then. What kind of coverage do you, what kind of coverage did you get in the newspapers and magazines and television? Now, we don't get any coverage hardly now. You know, uh, we kind of feel like, as far as Cone Mills is concerned, they have the media bought off because <laughs> it more or less goes <clears throat> it all goes their way. But, but go ahead and tell us. We have had some some pretty positive reports coming out of uh, Charlotte uh, and Greensboro. We have some you know pretty liberal or straightforward approaches in dealing with the things that we're dealing with now, such as the struggle that we have here in dealing with uh, insurance fights and uh, pension uh, ESOP employee stock ownership plans. And the media now has begun to show some changes in their ways of, of, of not totally anti-union and more or less becoming, you know, more mutual. And so some reporters, but not all of them. We still get, we feel like, the short end of the stick. But you know, has some liberalization to it. We you did have, see. we did have, uh, what was that, Professor, 
professor or somebody wrote an article. You remember that? Was, no, I can't remember the guy's name, but we have had some positive ones. But, that was you know, real. That we was have had real. some positive ones about he a couple of months back. He came out of like Duke University or something like that. Yeah. Got out a of real good article about the union. So it, it's, it's improved somewhat, but yet and still we got a long ways to go. What do you think, Bob? What's that? <laughs> Read the side. <laughs> oh, about the differences, you know. Just hold it just a moment. We have to shift the camera a little bit. But the media coverage versus oh. media coverage now Don't versus. Don't feel like them. it was all just about all negative. This, you know, in other words, the unions are the bad guys. Do you do you think? How, do you, what what do you think is different now? Well, uh, now. Uh, the media does sometimes come along and help the unions at times, I mean, in their fights. And then you find, like he said, some reporters are altogether different. They don't go with you. Do, do you look at that, Bob, in your <coughs> overall experience in working in textile? Do you see that as a change in the media somewhat better than they were then or for now? Uh, What's the difference, if any? Well, I can't tell whether there's any difference, really. Okay. Anybody else? Nothing? No. Um, I wonder if uh, Joanne and Cindy and Bonnie, could you all ask Bob, since he's lived here all these years, if the union has always been so visible? Because, I mean, right now you're plumb, you know, right across the street from the mill. So maybe you could talk about where you are <coughs> situated and visibility with Bob. And, and Bob also touched on early in our conversation that this place burnt down once, right? Yes. And maybe yes. you could tell us about uh, that. This was a company store at one time, and it did burn down one time. And it, the holler, it hollowed out. It didn't completely burn down, and they rebuilt it. A uh, long time ago, uh, probably, she was going to ask me about 54. I was in union. Now I cannot be union. I'm non-bargaining. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll find I'm fair and honest as it come. And uh, I was in union. And I was in a strike in 54. I did stand at the gate and show the people how I felt. Some of my friends was hollering, calling people names, scabs and things like that. And I didn't agree with that. I told them, I said, we've got to work with them. We've got to win them in our way. You'll do more standing here letting them know you're dissatisfied with the conditions. Just standing here silently, seeing them doing things they shouldn't than to call them names. I said, you're going to make enemies. You'll win them quicker by standing here silently and letting them know you how you feel. Did it work? Did you have more people on the picket lines? We had more people that joined the union back then, but our union wasn't very strong. Uh, we didn't have a meeting place, really, uh, and it wasn't very strong. Pete's, I forgot the boy's name that was representative of the union. Pete somebody. Brandon? Brandon. I believe it was. Peter Brandon. Yeah. Well, can I ask a question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Bob, at that time, what, what was your union dues at that time? Uh, I don't even remember, Brenda, honestly. Uh, I paid union dues, but I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. And they would not take them out of your pay. You had to pay them yourself. Mm -hmm. So like a insurance uh, system now where you come around and hand do system collection, that's what it was. Yes. Did you like the union at that time, Bob? Well, I believed in it. I was right Most in there. I was, was, I was a, a uh, committee. I sat down and talked to Mr. Cone just like I'd talk to you. We feel like we're we're pretty active right now. Do you, uh, Bob? Do you think the union think has ever been this active? No. Even in the fifties when you had a strike. No, uh, we wasn't strong back then. Uh, but you're, I see you're you're active now. Okay. You see, I'm kind of. Uh, biased. I'm, I'm not. I'm not bargaining. I, I cannot belong to you. But I think you believe. You'll see that I do believe in the union. I did tell you that my wages started raising when I heard the union came. Yeah. Okay. Well, since y'all, <clears throat> excuse me, since y'all didn't have a place to meet, what did y'all do? Meet in each other's homes, different homes, or we met in different places. Yes. Was that design, or just because you didn't have a place to meet? Well, you. Uh, afraid of, uh, you know, we were talking about earlier about the union is now more visible, 
were you afraid to meet publicly or? No, I've never, now I don't know about the others, but you'll find I've never been afraid of nobody and nothing. Mm -hmm. I was in World War II, come out of World War II, worked in a bakery, quit the bakery job, come to work at Cone Wheel. And I have talked to supervisors, I've talked to Clarence Cone, and expressed my views. I've never been afraid of nobody, and right now, I'm not afraid of nobody. Good. You see, I've worked long all my life, and I'm old enough to retire. I should have done retired. No, you should. But I haven't. What about your co-workers back then versus uh, now? It, does it, in your opinion, is there more fear uh, when you mention union or in the South, predominantly there's have been, you know, the unions have been more or less uh, not able to come out and people have a tendency to be fearful of the union due to, you know, the company and the bad publicity and the bad things that they heard. Do you think people are more open now than they were yes. back in, in those yes. days? Yes, they're more open and they're, they're standing up for their rights. Okay. So back then, people...